How is everybody doing? Good, good. Let me just say, this is a difficult topic for me to talk about, and I don't like talking about this topic, but also I get excited because I, I think the benefits of talking about finances and talking about uh, what we're talking about today have the, have the ability to not just change your life today, but to change your future and to change your family line. And so we're going to uh, be continuing this series that we started last night. But how many would say that um, I am, how many of you would say this? I am confident on, um, I am confident that I know how to manage money like real well. Like, I, and if you don't raise your hand, that's okay. If you do raise your hand, also okay. But how many would say, I, I'm super confident that I know how to manage my, my personal finances like really, really well. Now, if you look around, nobody raised their hand. Because I feel like to a certain extent when it comes to a biblical understanding for finances and when it comes to uh, not just a biblical understanding, like a practical understanding for finances, whether or not you choose to include scripture, which I would recommend you do and why we do series like this, uh, or not, I feel like for the most part, none of us feel like we've nailed it in the area of our finances, and if you've ever felt like you have no idea what you're doing or you, you have room for improvement, then this series is definitely for you. Now, my name is Nathan. I'm the lead pastor here at Ridgeline Church and so excited to be with you. And I just want to give a huge shout out to all of our setup team and our first impressions team this morning. Won't you give them an amazing hand? So immediately following the message, we'll be doing the baptisms. There'll be a, a, the baptismals right behind the screen. We'll move that. And then afterwards, uh, we've got Cokes and popcorn and different stuff that we're hanging out and just celebrating with the, the people that are here this morning to get baptized. So you're invited to the after party for the baptism today. But all of our setup team made all of this happen. And so we're, we love them and we're super proud of them. And also, if... Um, also, if uh, uh, you're interested in being on a team here at Ridgeline, then Starting Point will be coming around in just a few weeks, and that is a great starting point for you. Now, one quick announcement for me to make right here is we are working, for those of you that have elementary age kids, we are working on getting our, element, our uh, Elevate Kids uh, back up and running, and that is basically uh, first grade through fifth grade, somewhere right in there. And uh, But we also need some volunteers uh, to help as we re- relaunch that ministry. So if you're interested, uh, either let me know, or let Crystal know, or if you don't know our new kids director, if you know our new kids director, Emily, uh, then make sure you let her know. But let somebody know that you're interested. And our goal is that we would only ever... Um, uh, have you serve once a month. So it's, it's, not, it's not a lot. You won't miss much. So now last week we started this series, Big Gains. And yes, this is a financial series. And this is not, but let me just clarify, this is not going to be a giving series. Now, part of uh, uh, biblical principles for finances will include generosity, but we have not made, we won't be making this series all about, you know, give, give, give. It, it won't be like this. This will be a very balanced uh, kind of biblical series on more so on stewardship. And so uh, this, in, uh, this is a series on financial stewardship, which includes generosity, but it's way more than that. And in order to be a healthy biblical church, we have to talk about finances. Why? Because Jesus talked a lot about finances. In fact, he talked about it more than he talked about heaven or hell. And so uh, we're going to be talking about uh, that today. So very excited. So we called this series Big Gains, and not just because of my gym routine, but also because... (laughs) It's a joke, guys. <laughs> Not just because of my... Okay. We'll move along. We'll keep it serious this morning if you want to be serious. But here's why it's so important. Because your wallet, right? Like we, we, like we introduced last week, your wallet is directly connected to your heart. Now, I asked this question last week. We said, how many would be willing, would raise your hand and be willing? Don't do it. But how many would raise their hand and be willing to tell publicly how much you make every year? Like what your annual household income is, right? None of us would be willing to do that. Why? Because it's personal and it's private to us. And and what we have to understand about finances is that your wallet is directly connected to your heart. You see, and the important part about this is, well, God doesn't need our money. He does want our heart. And where your treasure is, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
And so throughout this series, we'll be exploring the biblical perspective of wealth and what our biblical obligations are in financial stewardship. And we'll be learning simple steps to take, uh, to take now for a better financial present and future. And so in part two today, we're going to be looking at some very practical, applicable steps that you can do and accomplish in your finances starting today. Now, and I believe that the biblical principles in this series have the ability, if you apply them, have the ability to change your life, not just today, but your family for generations to to come. Because when it comes to living a godly life, we can't exempt our finances. When it comes to living a godly life, you can't exempt your finances. You can't say, God, I'm going to give you everything except for my bank account. I'm going to give you everything except for my tithe. I'm going to give you everything except for my wallet. I'm going to give you everything you can't. I'm going to give you everything, but I'm not going to manage debt very well. I'm going to give you everything, but I'm going to overextend my credit. I'm going to give you everything, but I'm going to buy things that I need or I want when I want them. And I'm not going to have good biblical financial stewardship. Now, I remember several years ago, this is an embarrassing story. My, my in-laws are here, by the way, uh, Mike and Linda. I love you guys. They don't, apparently, but I, I do. Uh, my in-laws are here. This is an embarrassing story to tell in front of them. They, they probably already know, so it's all good. But several years ago, I remember uh, uh, buying my first motorcycle. Here it is. And that, oh, that's Isley, who just turned 13. So that was a, yeah, that was a, a long, long time ago. And I remember I wanted a motorcycle so bad, and I wanted a Harley, really, but I couldn't afford a Harley. But I, I went, and I just went to check out, buy, like, a motorcycle. I just wanted to check one out. And, of course, I was young and fell for the sales pitch and ended up with a financing, uh, uh, you know, financing the bike in a way that was not wise at all and ended up, you know, uh, financing it in a way that, you know, the interest rates were incredibly high. And every, it was just a terrible financial decision on my part uh, to, to purchase this this motorcycle, especially to purchase it the way that I purchased it. And it was one of those things where they deferred all the interest for like the first two years. And then, and then boom, after two years, the interest rate hits you huge. And, and it was just, it was an awful financial decision. And I remember uh, after uh, buying the bike, I had lost a job. Um, and there was, there was some kind of some complicated finan- financial uh, issues that we would go through as a family. We would end up you know, short. This was right after 2008 and the, the the financial crisis and all that. And so we had to short sell our house and all and all of these things. And so finally, we just had to stop paying for this motorcycle. And uh, and eventually, the bank calls and says, "Hey, we're going to come pick up your motorcycle." And I remember I was at work, and I remember that my I came home from work, and both my kids were very sad to see they looked out the window while a man backed into our driveway loaded up daddy's motorcycle, and took it away. And they still remember this to this day. They'll still talk about how sad that was to watch that happen. So this was a bad financial decision on my part that affected our family. So I think what we have to do is begin to ask ourselves some questions. What we need to do is begin to ask ourselves some questions. And here's a question that I want you to ask yourself about the inside of you is what is it inside of me that needs this right now? What is it inside of me that needs this right now? Is it greed? Is it insecurity? Is it impatience? Is it envy? Is it entitlement? What is it about a big purchase, about a purchase that you are are not financially ready to make that says, what is it on the inside of you that says, but I need this right now? What causes that? And when you identify that for you, like I said, maybe it's, maybe it's, uh, it's envy or you want to be what everybody looks at and goes, man, that's the car I want to have. Whatever it is, ask yourself this follow-up question, should I trust that? Should I trust greed? Should, should I trust my impatience? Should I trust my insecurity? Because I drive a beater car, and everybody else at work drives a nice car. Or I live in a small house, and everybody else seems to live in a big house. Or shoes, or guitars, or whatever it is. 
What is it, and should I trust it? And so I want to share with you three principles real quick, and here's the deal. You guys are all very smart, uh, hence you come to Ridgeline. And so (laughs) you guys are all very smart, and so I'm sure that you have thought of these three principles, or you know these three principles instinctually, but probably you've never just taken the time to kind of write them down or think about them or put words to these things that you know. So here's the first principle, and it's this is there is no connection between feeling content and having money, right? There's no connection. Psychology will tell us that. People who are rich will tell us that, right? There's no connection between uh, you and the media and ads and people around you. They'll convince you that this is not true, but instinctually, we all know it's true. We all know this is true. There's no connection between being content or feeling content and having money. Second, wealth for the sake of wealth is a futile pursuit. Wealth for the sake of wealth is a futile pursuit. It will leave you empty. And I know uh, down deep on the inside of us, we know this, right? If I just spend my whole life pursuing money, and I come to the end of my life and can't figure out why I'm uncontent. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty obvious. You spent your whole life pursuing something that will never satisfy you. Number three, your definition of wealth is a moving target. How many of you, let me, and don't raise your hand, but how many of you are making Money today, an amount of money today that when you were 22 and first getting married, that you said, if I was making that much money, I'd be rich. And now you're making that much money and you say, well, you know, I'm not wealthy. You know, like like that's somebody, somebody who was, you know, I I only make 250,000 a year. People who make a couple million a year, that's wealthy. And maybe you're here, you make a couple million a year, and, and you're going, hey, I'm little, like, hey, I only make a couple million a year. And, and the, pe- the people who are rich, like, if you make over 10 million a year, that's wealth. And what do we do? We, wealth is this constant moving target, and everyone ahead of us is wealthy. We're not wealthy, but everyone ahead of us is wealthy. And you, you would say, I- I'm not wealthy. I'm never wealthy, Right? Because we make that target move every time we take a financial step or we get a a pay increase, that target moves. And here's what happens. Let me show you this as an example. And I love this principle, but here it is. If you make wealth your pursuit, then your life will feel and look a lot like this. So we got you, this is you. This is your job or your job if you're a Bible scholar. And when you have this mentality that your job is your provider, then you'll end up getting this whole financial thing messed up and you'll get it wrong. And so this is you and you get up every morning and you put on your work clothes and you, you, know, you take a shower, but not in that order. And, and so you, you get ready for work and then you head into work and you go to your job and you put in the 8, 10, 12, 16 hours, whatever it is. And then after every week or every two weeks or whatever, you get a paycheck and, and then you go, you know what? Look what I did. Look what I did. This is mine. I worked hard. I earned it. Look what I did. Now, for a lot of us, we, we end up in this cycle where we go back and forth, and every day we go to work, and every, every other week we get a paycheck, and, and we go, man, look how hard I worked. But here's the problem. When you live your life this way, you eventually become uncontent. You eventually become unsatisfied where, where you're at. And for a lot of us, you might be unsatisfied in your finances specifically because you always feel like you're working harder than the amount of money that we make, right? Right? Most of us would never say, you know what, I really should get a pay decrease, (laughs) right? Most of us say, no, man, I go into work and I work so hard and they only give me X amount of dollars. Most of us would say that. And so we, we, we put this thing in where we, we go to our job, we work really hard, and then we get everything that we deserve because we went to work. And then eventually we stop liking our job. We feel like we deserve more. We feel like we're never making enough. They don't treat us well enough. 
They don't treat us the, the way that, man, they, they, they should give us insurance too, and, and they should take care of our retirement too, and, and they, should take, they should do all the things that would help us financially. And if that's your perspective, I'm trying to think of how to say this nicely, you're wrong. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 8. If you have your Bibles, feel free to turn there. We're going to start in verse 17. I didn't say it very nice. So here we go, Deuteronomy 8. I believe this is Moses speaking. And you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. Yeah, this is Moses speaking, and he's, he's, he's I don't want to say... Um, He's, he's bringing a little correction over the people of Israel. So you may say, my power and my, the strength of my hands have reduced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. Where do we get the ability to produce wealth? God. God gives us the ability to produce wealth. Your ability to generate an income is a gift from God the Father. And so watch, when we take this same triangle concept and we make it look like this, then our whole world changes. The way we view our finances changes and and, uh, our life becomes more meaningful and more content, right? So we have, uh, God gives us the ability to generate wealth, and so then we go out and we get a good job, and, and then we realize that our job is not our provider, right, but that God's our provider because he's the one who gives us the ability to create wealth, and, and when we live in this kind of this triangle as opposed to this straight line, what happens is we realize that God placed us at our job as a missionary and to be a light because he loves the people who work at your job so much so that he sent you to go be there as a witness, and, and so then you realize, you know, I'm not doing this job just to get self-fulfillment. I'm actually here because God ordained it, and he wants me to be here because God loves your coworkers so much. He placed you at your job, and he wants them to know him, and so you're, that's why you're there. And so your, your job kind of becomes this, this, your personal missionary field or your, your mission in life to be a witness and example to those around you about how good God the Father is. And, and, it, and instead of this back and forth thing where there's no contentment or, or, or you're, you're frustrated or whatever, you have purpose now in your life. And your, your finances come into proper big biblical alignment. And every time you get a check, you don't say, look what I did. You say, look what God did. Every time you get paid. And for a lot of us, this is how we ended up in the financial mess that we were in. Because we did not have a biblical view of wealth. We had this kind of back and forth thing. And we ended up unhappy And we ended up in debt, and we ended up financially ruined. So here's a good biblical view of wealth. And I love this, Proverbs chapter 11, first half of verse 28. Those who trust in their riches will fail. When the line just goes back and forth, it's a recipe for failure. Those who trust and their riches will fail. You see, we have to understand that we worship the provider, not the provided. We worship the blesser, not the blessing. Everything that we have and we enjoy comes from God. So how do we make effective changes today? How do we stop living from week to week or from paycheck to paycheck? And I want to share with you three principles. And then remind me to give, I, I got some books to give away. Remind me to give these away because I was supposed to do it at the top of the message. So I want to share with you three principles. They're, they're from this book, Dave Ramsey's uh, The Total Money Makeover. They're the first three, or they're kind of from this book. Uh, I have four, actually. Three of them are from this book, uh, The Total Money Makeover. If you've never read this, let me encourage you to uh, read these. I'll give both of these away in just a little bit. Um, but how to change your finances today. Here's the first step that, that um, would be talked about in that book. Save $1,000. Immediately begin to save money today, right now. 
put $1,000 in a savings account. And it may take you a couple weeks, it may take you a couple months, but make that your first goal. And this becomes your temporary emergency fund while you take the next few steps. And one, one of the best ways for you to do this is begin to spy on your money. You know, a lot of us don't look at, you know, we don't, you do like our parents or grandparents used to do where we, we balance the checkbook in an analog sense. And because of that, maybe we're subscribed to 10 or 15 different things and four or five of them we don't even use anymore, but we don't remember that we don't, that we are subscribed to them. And so money just keeps coming out of our account and for things that we're not even using or or there's, you know, you might realize like, for instance, my AT&T, my phone bill is direct withdrawal. So every once in a while, I'd make sure to look that the bill is still the amount that we agreed it was going to be when I wrote the contract, right? When we signed the contract. Because we spy on our money. I've had bills that we agreed, you know, you get under a contract and then you're six months in and all of a sudden the bill shoots way up and if you weren't spying on your money, you would never know that. Don't spend 100% of your money. Don't spend 100% of what you bring in. Don't spend, and certainly don't spend over 100% of what you bring in. But make sure when you make a budget, which we should make, everybody should make a budget, that you budget 100% of your income. Don't spend 100% of your income, but budget 100% of your income. Number two, we just covered this a little bit. Live on less than you make. Live on less than you make. Like this seems like such a, this is simple math, right? It seems like such an obvious thing that a lot of us get caught in this trap of I need it now, I want it now, I've got to have it now. And and so then that's why we asked this question a minute ago, what is it on the inside of me that needs this now and should I trust it? See, for the majority of us, we don't have an income problem, we have an outgoing problem. For a lot of us, problem is not how much is coming in. The problem is how much is going out. And so make sure you live on less than you make. Number three, begin to pay off your debt. Now, specifically in this book, it will tell you how to do a snowball thing where you, you, know, you line up all your, your debts and you pay off the smallest one first and you just generate, they call it the snowball effect, to generate momentum as you're paying off your debts. But let me just say, most often debt is, sell- now, I, like, there's legitimate emergencies that happen from time to time, but I'm not talking about legitimate emergencies that happen from time to time. Most often, debt is selling out your future for a temporary thrill in the moment. Most often, debt is selling out your future for a temporary thrill right now. And debt is a thief, and it robs your future for temporary enjoyment in your present. Debt is a thief. Proverbs 22, uh, 7 says this. It says, the rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. The borrower is slave to the lender. How many of us have phone numbers that we, we've pre-programmed to say, don't answer this, it's a debt collector. Don't answer this, it's, you know, it's the bank. Don't answer this, it's, you know, whatever. Just me. Okay. Not anymore. Praise the Lord. Number four. This is the fourth step, and we'll leave this up if you want to take a picture or write this down. I, let me recommend, especially that you write it down or take a picture, uh, especially if you're newly married. Have an emergency fund. Have an emergency fund. So you immediately put away $1,000 just as a minor, small emergency fund, and, and then you, you, you budget so you can learn to live on less than you make, and then you begin to snowball your debt, and once you're debt-free, then you have a, a real emergency fund. A lot of financial planners will say an emergency fund should be anywhere from three months to six months worth of your expenses, not your income, your expenses, and that way if you ever got in an emergency or one of you lose a job, Job or whatever that you know you can, you're good for several months if it takes time to replace. Okay, everybody good? Just good. 
You all right? You guys are like deer in the headlights up here. It's very difficult. <laughs> Trying to talk to this is, is challenging. All right. This should be the last thing. How do we deal with debt? I love this. T- write this down, especially if you have debt. Number one, get a plan. Get a plan. How do you deal with debt? Get a plan. This is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to take care of it. This is what I'm going to stop spending money on. This is how I'm going to budget. This is how I'm going to make it work. This is how we're going to make adjustments. These are things we don't need to buy anymore. Instead of buying, you know, I don't know, name brand, we're going to buy generic at the grocery store. You know, whatever. Get a plan. Figure out how you're going to do it. Number two, get disciplined. Get disciplined. A plan is just a plan until you put it into motion, right? A plan is just a plan until you put it into action. A plan on a piece of paper will do nothing for you financially unless you're disciplined to carry it out. Number three, if you can, increase your income. Go get a side job. Go get a second job. Go figure out, go deliver, uh, do Uber Eats or deliver pizza at, in the evenings when you're off work. Get uh, intense and be determined that I'm willing to do whatever it takes in this season. I'm willing to do whatever it takes in the next six months or the next year or the next two years to make sure that I live debt free. Increase your income in ways that work for you and your lifestyle, in ways that work for you know, what you're trying to do. Ask for a raise. The worst thing your boss can say is no. And then take all of the raise, because you are already living on less, that take all of your raise, put it towards debt. You already know how to live on what you're already living on. Just stay there. You get a raise, put it all towards debt. Number four, this one's important. Ask God for help. Ask God to help you. Ask God to give you strategies. Ask God to, to take care of it for you. Ask God to, to, to give you, you know, just favor with people. I, I, I don't have a lot of time to tell the story because we got to get into the baptisms. But I remember several years ago, my wife had a $55,000 surgery. And when it was all said and done, we paid about five grand. And we did not have insurance to cover any of it. We, didn't, we had to go out of state. It was, she had to see a specialist. She had to see, you know, whatever. We just asked God, you got to help us. We can't afford this. And she's got to have this surgery. And we would call the banks, or not the banks, we would call the hospitals and the doctors and, and go back and forth on, hey, here's what we can give you today. And can you work with us a little more and whatever? And, you know, and you fill out all, take the time to fill out all the paperwork for income and all that because sometimes, you know, they're looking to write things off and all that. So, so we, just, we just trusted the Lord. We had to make it work when we had to make it work. But we just ask God, God, this is a mountain that I can't move. This is a mountain that probably to this day we still would be paying off. But God moved the mountain because we asked for help. We just went in knowing God's going to help us. God's going to help us. And so if you got debt, maybe it's a car payment, God, help me with my debt. Help me to pay off this car. Give me favor maybe with the financing company. Give me insight on how to make extra money. Help there to be a glitch in their system. Moves the decimal point. (laughs) Something, God, help me. Help me. Starting to manage your money well. What God has entrusted you with will change your life forever. Beginning to manage your money properly will change your life. In fact, Luke 16 says it like this. We come to a close. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. It is my belief that God wants to bless his people, but he will not bless them to the extent past the extent that he is able to trust them because he never wants your financial situation to be a burden to you, but he wants to use you financially to be a blessing to the world. I remember hearing a story a couple of years ago from my friend Justin. He talked about a man who was a, who was a pastor and he's thrown in the category of those, uh, you know, those um, 
TV, what are the ones that are always after money? You know, like, um, not televangelists, there's another word for it, but anyway. Name it and claim it. He, he's thrown into that group uh, a lot. Um, you know, one of those get rich pastors. And, and, my, and I don't know any of these people personally, and, and I won't say a lot of their names. But anyway, he's, he's in this, he gets often by a lot of even good people, Christian people would say, you know, he's just in it for the money, he just, whatever. And, and there was a missionary organization that I know of on the other side of the world that had dried up financially completely, and it is a massive missionary organization. They've led over a million people to Jesus in the nation that they work, and, and they have orphanages, and they do, they, they, I mean, just such great people running. And the Lord spoke to this man and said, I want you to write a million dollar check to this ministry. He didn't even know this ministry, but he was obedient. He wrote a million dollar check and he sent it on the very day they were about to have to cut payroll and stop a bunch of expenses. A million dollar check showed up. Now, without raising our hands, (laughs) how many of us could send a million dollar check? I, my assumption is none of us could do that. But he could because God could trust him with it. That when God spoke to him, he would just step out in faith and in obedience and immediately do what he was asked to do. And it's my belief that that's what God wants how in, in some way or another, and I don't, maybe it's not finances for you, maybe I'm not trying to make it all about money or whatever, understand my heart, but I believe that that's what God wants out of all of us, to resource us in such a way with either gifts or talents, or maybe it's finances, or, or whatever it is, and then to bring us into a place of obedience where, where, like the scripture verse just said in Luke, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. We prove our faithfulness and God increases his trust in us. And when we started out, we were just stewarding a little bit. We were just trying to get out of debt. We were just doing our snowball. We were just putting $1,000 in the offering or in in the savings account. We were just doing that. We were just doing that. And we, we began to be faithful and then God began to bring increase. And now when God speaks to us, we don't have to think about it. We just, we just show up and volunteer. We just write the check. We just give in a way that only we can give. Because God could trust us with a little. He gave us increase. So here, as we close. It is my prayer for you that through the principles of this series that you would learn to make big gains in your finances that you would learn to make big gains in your finances. Imagine with me for a moment, not living what it would feel like to no longer live from paycheck to paycheck. Imagine what it would feel like to know that if I was to lose my job today, I have enough money in a savings account that I don't have to find a job tomorrow. In fact, I don't have to find a job for several weeks. I'm gonna start looking immediately, but even if I can't find anything, and it takes me three months, I'm still gonna be okay. Imagine, it's Solomon who writes that a a godly man leaves an inheritance for his children's children's children. Imagine knowing that you've stewarded your finances so well that you're not just taken care of, and it's not just your kids that are taken care of, but generations upon generations after you are taken care of. Let's pray.